Ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, my name is Romanos. I am a historian and we are continuing our journey in this beautiful story about Byzantium. If you like this story, feel free to hit the like button, comment and subscribe to this new channel to be notified when a new video is uploaded. You can also leave your own suggestions about how this story should continue in the comments section. Comments regarding not only the presentation of the story, but also the story itself. This will give me the needed feedback to improve my videos and will engage all of you in the creation of these videos. In the previous episode, we saw the decisions that Roman Emperor Ioannis and Heir Constantinos made for the upcoming war with the Ottomans. We saw the negotiations that the Byzantine throne had with the Byzantine higher classes and we saw the preparations for the war mainly the construction of a powerful fleet. Finally, we saw the war with Epirus and the annexation of Farta and Kefalonia by Byzantium. In this episode, we will see the completion of the preparations and the Great War with the Ottomans. Now, Ioannis had to concentrate all of his forces for the war. In the 7th of April of 1446, he signed an alliance with Albania. The knights needed another month or two to reach an agreement. Finally, in June the 2nd, Ioannis also signed an alliance agreement with the knights. Immediately, he sent his diplomats to improve the Byzantine relations with Hungary. and Austria. Meanwhile, Ioannis received a report from one of his spies. It would be an understatement to say our economy is performing poorly. In fact, some would say this is a disaster. And while we struggle, our subjects of all people are doing more than well. Perhaps we are not taxing them enough. Ioannis decided that he did not need to tax Athens, and this increased the prestige of the Byzantine throne. Ioannis also started improving relations with Poland-Lithuania. An alliance with one or even better two of those great nations like Poland, Austria or Hungary would save Byzantium from the Ottomans for good. Poland was rivaling Hungary, so an alliance with both was not a possible outcome. Nevertheless, Hungary was rivaling Venice. If Byzantium rivaled Venice, it would be more possible to ally Hungary. But Ioannis did not want to disturb his relations with Venice at the moment. They had not announced officially Byzantium as their rival, and he feared that if he did so, they would backstab him during the war with the Ottomans. The only real rival and enemy of Byzantium were the Ottomans. Meanwhile, in about six months, the Byzantine shipyards would deliver the new ships for the fleet, and most importantly, the two early guards. The Ottomans did not have this kind of ships, and this would determine the naval war as we will see later. In July the 15th, important news arrived in the Byzantine court. Naples lost its independence and became a junior partner under Arab. A report came to the Byzantine throne about the business failure of some trade family. After long thought, Ioannis decided that he simply did not have the money to compensate the traders. They knew what they were getting into after all. To save money, Ioannis ordered the fort of Morea to be mothballed. Byzantium already had many loans and would need even more to sustain the war efforts. Every saved ducat was valuable. In September the 25th, Byzantium celebrated a royal marriage with Athens. It would be the last celebration in the Byzantine court before the war. In the 16th of October, the first early car of the Byzantine fleet was ready and was ordered to join the fleet in Morea. The next month, the rest of the ships would be ready. So Ioannis, in secret negotiations with Albania and the Knights, confirmed that they would join the war against the Ottomans if he promised to give them land in the peace deal. But the intelligence information that would determine the outcome of the war almost from the beginning, and Ioannis anxiously waited to come, was now available. The Ottomans, in their arrogance, had left the forts of Kokacheli and Macedonia without any garrison. 
After a surprise attack, the Byzantines could get them both in their hands in a muffler shot, gaining the momentum of this war and putting the Ottomans in big trouble. It was the time. It was the great moment that the Byzantines waited for years. It was the moment to fight for their real independence from the Ottomans. It was the time to liberate Greece. It was the time to fulfill their destiny. They would succeed or they would die forever. Ioannis increased the maintenance of the Byzantine army and navy to the maximum and waited the last three ships to be delivered. Then he made the secret move that nobody waited. He did the unthinkable. He decided to match the Ottoman army numbers once and for all in this war. If he failed, Byzantium would not exist to repay any loan. It was really the time of no tomorrow. He thought of Leonidas. Itam he epitas. With it or on it. He would either come back a winner holding his shield or he would come back carried on his shield instead. He ordered three mercenary armies to be mustered in the Peloponnese, somewhere outside Mistras castle in Morea. I don't believe that. What are we doing here? The Emperor ordered us to leave Constantinople and station here. Where are the girls? Where are the taverns of Constantinople? How are we going to go through the winter? Don't be an idiot, Theodosius. The Emperor probably had a good reason to send his troops here. But he didn't even send a proper general to command this army. How am I supposed to impose discipline to the soldiers if there isn't any serious high-ranking officer in our lines, Arkhite? You are not right, Theodosius. General Acropolitis is here with the soldiers. Acropolitis is a retired officer and he is here because he likes the feeling of commanding troops. He wants to remember the days when he was still young. But he is actually not commanding anything. He is not appointed by the Supreme Military Council. He came here on his own, probably to get away of his wife. Lieutenant Zagoretis, don't you have any honor? He is a senior officer. This is not a proper way to talk about him. I could send you to the court martial just by reporting your words. But you will not, Akakios, because you know that what I say is true. They sent us here with no food, no clothing, no boots, no nothing for six months. The soldiers can eat only what they can hunt, and the local population has problems with theft and rapes. How are we going to discipline a fully demoralized army with no proper senior command? I only hope that the Ottomans declare war soon. It's the only way for us to get some food and money and for the soldiers to get in line. Theodosius, I believe that you had too much wine. Go to sleep or tomorrow morning I will personally send you in jail. Oh, all right, all right. Good night, Captain Komnenos. See you tomorrow. But Captain Komnenos had the same thoughts like his subordinate. Only he couldn't admit anything or the whole company would rebel the next moment. We'll see. I hope our beloved Emperor has something important in his mind for this army. Or else, he said to himself. Then he went for a walk down the river. He couldn't sleep after the discussion with Zagoritis. The company morale was very low. In the 28th of December of 1446, a few days after Christmas, the Byzantine army consisting of 24 regiments was encamped in Corinth, too far from any Ottoman province trying to convince the Ottomans that they were in a drill. The Byzantine fleet, consisting of 21 ships, including two carracks, was docked in Morea. The Ottomans, while the Byzantine army was in full morale ready to start the campaign, still had their forts in Macedonia and Kokacheli and Garrison. It was like Constantinus had predicted, a complete surprise attack that would give the Romans the momentum in this war. Constantinus, leading a small army of 2,000 men, moved towards Morea to embark in the fleet. He planned to disembark in Constantinople and march to Bocacelli immediately. In the 1st of January of 1447, 
a date that would remain in history, Ioannis Paleologos, Roman Emperor, declared war on the hated Ottomans. Albania and the Knights would also help Byzantium in this war. It was a night that Ioannis couldn't sleep. He was alone in the royal tent and he was thinking about the war that had just started. Early in the morning of the first day of this year, instead of celebrations, he had ordered the Minister of Foreign Affairs to deliver to the Ottoman ambassador in Constantinople the declaration of war. The ambassador started laughing and said that this was the great opportunity that the Sultan waited to crush Byzantium once and for all. Ioannis started to have doubts. What if he was wrong? Constantinos was marching to Moreas and was not here to stand by his brother. Would it be a success or would it be the official end of the Roman Empire? The history of more than 2000 years suddenly felt too heavy for him. Would he be the last Roman Emperor? And it would be his own decision that would cause this fate. He struggled with the thought. Anyway, the die is cast, he said. After a sleepless night, the next morning he gave General Acropolitis the order to march. In the 3rd of January, the mighty Byzantine fleet transferring the small army of Constantinos sailed for Constantinople. The same day, the rest of the Byzantine army started the long march to Thessaloniki. The Ottoman army of Thessaloniki started their march to Constantinople. The military plan was to besiege Thessaloniki and Kokacheli before the Ottomans managed to take Constantinople. Then, in a series of battles, the Allied army would face the Ottomans before they could concentrate their armies in one place, and taking advantage of their numerical superiority as well as the tactical genius of General Skanderberg, they would defeat the Ottomans, expelling them from the Balkans. If they managed to take Gallipoli before the Ottomans managed to reinforce their armies and return in the Balkan side, they would block the straits and they would besiege the rest of the Balkans without any additional threat. In the 12th of January, Constantinos disembarked in Constantinople. The Ottoman fleet didn't even try to stop the Byzantines. The Allies had already won the naval war. Constantino started his march to Kokace. In the 14th, a hidden Ottoman army outside Constantinople was ready to engage Constantino. He had to use scorched earth tactics to delay them and avoid a certain defeat. On the 28th of January, Constantinos reached Kokacheli and the vanguard of the great Allied Balkan army reached Thessaloniki. The sieges started. When all of the separate Byzantine armies met in the rally point of Thessaloniki, they were ordered to occupy the Greek territories in Thessaly, Epirus and Castoria. But the initial plan of the Byzantines seemed to have failed. The Ottomans already had concentrated all of their forces in the siege of Constantinople. On the 1st of March, both the forts of Kokacheli and Thessaloniki had fallen to Byzantine hands as planned. Ioannis, in order to save money, gave the occupation of Kokacheli and hence the payroll of the garrison to Athens. But he forgot to do the same for Thessaloniki. Two months in the war and he already had started to make mistakes.
the army of Thessaloniki was separated in five parts and each part was ordered to proceed with the immediate occupation of a certain province in the Balkans. Meanwhile, Constantinos and his small army were safe in Thessaloniki. The Byzantine fleet could transfer whoever they wanted in the Aegean Sea. The Ottoman fleet was already defeated without a single battle. Nevertheless, in the 21st, an Ottoman fleet of 12 transport ships was crushed in the Sea of Marmara. On the 16th of April, Thessaly, Epirus, Astoria and Ceres were in Byzantine hands. The rest of the Balkan provinces started falling one after the other. Constantine fell in the 21st Skopje fell in the 24th Sofia fell in the 29th. Ohrid fell in the 3rd of May. Plovdiv fell in the 12th of the same month. Meanwhile, 16,000 men had rallied back in Ceres. Inside the Byzantine camp in Ceres, the army morale was in its highest. We are winning, Theodosi. I told you so. Not only we attacked the Ottomans first, but we are winning this war. What do you have to say now? Is General Lagopolitz good enough for you? You damn idiot. Ceres army decided to engage a small Ottoman army of 2,000 men in nearby Constantine. And then something happened that the Allies did not expect. The two Ottoman armies of 15,000 strong each decided that it was time to face the Byzantines in battle and unexpectedly lifted the siege of Constantinople. Until now, the plan of Constantinos had been followed to the letter. The Allies held in their hands almost all of the Balkans, and the Ottomans did not have in their hands a single enemy province. It was expected for them to start making mistakes. They lost the siege progress in Constantinople, and the city was relieved and started gathering supplies again. Now they had to take back all of the fallen Balkan provinces if they wanted to win this war. Meanwhile, Pidin, Nikopol, Lore, and Tirnovo also fell to the Byzantines. With the news of the Ottoman advance, all of the Allied armies were ordered to rally in Constantine. Fortunately, General Skanderberg was not cut off by this maneuver. He was in Constantine with the rest of the army. But A. Constantinos, with 2,000 men, was cut off in Tinovo by the advance of the two Ottoman armies. He could not reach Constantine.
Now they were marching to meet him in battle. A master of maneuvering that he was managed to escape the Ottomans in the direction of Burgas. by a small army of 80. Slightly outnumbered, he lost his army in the 30th of July, but he managed to escape unharmed. That same date, the two Ottoman armies finally split. A leaderless army of 16,000 men were trying to liberate Sofia, while their second army of 14,000 men was already too far in Nikopol, moving towards Tirnovo. The time had come. General Skanderberg ordered an immediate attack. And in the 28th of August, the Allied army of 30,000 men obliterated the Ottoman army in Sofia. It was the turning point of the war. Now, the Allies that occupied most of the Balkan territories also had numerical superiority in the war. They had double the Ottoman numbers. General Skanderberg, in a move that only generals of his magnitude would dare to make, he ordered the Allied army to also immediately engage the second Ottoman army in Nikopol. After also losing this second battle, the Ottomans and their allies retreated to Anatolia. With the Byzantines occupying all of the Balkans, they had nowhere else to go for reinforcing the armies. pursued by the Byzantine army. That arrived in Gallipoli and in just 10 months the Byzantines had reached their objective. The Balkans were free of any Ottoman threat and the siege of Gallipoli started. When Gallipoli fell, the Ottomans would have no means to liberate the Balkan provinces and they would surrender. Meanwhile, back in Constantinople, Constantinos, you are a military genius. Who could have predicted that you would have expelled the Ottomans from the Balkans in just 10 months. I am surprised. You must have been preparing this plan in your mind for a lot of time. For all of my life, Ioannis. For all of my life. 
In all of my military career, I tried and experimented with this plan in many occasions, from fights with rebels to the drawing table and back again. I knew that it was the only way to survive the Ottomans, but I kept it secret because the Ottomans have spies everywhere. You know that. It is a victory that will be remembered, Constantinos, and your name will... It is not a victory yet, Ioannis. And the stubborn General Skanderberg left us to see glory in the siege of the Ottoman capital in Edirne. He wants to be the first to take it of all people in history. But his voice started shivering. What is it, Constantinos? What is going on? We simply don't have the numbers, Johannes. After the two battles with the Ottomans, we lost a lot of soldiers. So even if we manage to breach the walls of Gallipoli with an artillery barrage from our fleet, we don't have the numbers to succeed in an immediate assault of the castle. If Skanderberg stayed, we would be successful. This means that it will be a normal siege in which we will need time, and we don't have time, Ioannis. The initial plan was to assault the castle. Now we are open to an attack from the Ottomans that will return from Anatolia. Remember that we cannot block the straits yet, we are still vulnerable. And moreover, in this attack, Skanderbeg will not be with us to lead the army as he is in Edirne. Ioannis could not find a single word to answer. He was overwhelmed by the news. According to the plan, with the departure of General Skanderberg for Edirne, the Allied fleet was ordered to use its cannons to give a devastating blow to the walls of Gallipoli. <laughs> The knights that have stayed safe away from any engagement now found the courage to invade Anatolia. But the fears of Constantinos did not become reality. The Ottomans selected not to attack the Allies in Gallipoli and instead decided to besiege Kukacelli. The final victory was close. When the news reached General Skanderberg, his only comment to his general was the following. I told them. I told them, didn't I? All the Ottomans need is a good old sword on their neck and when they find it, they are afraid. Too afraid to make any attack. But the Byzantine did not listen. Oh. Meanwhile, news from Corinth had arrived. The local peasants were about to rebel against the greedy local nobles that mistreated them. They had a petition for redress. Ioannis accepted the petition. He could not allow a peasant's rebellion in the middle of the war. Byzantium took a loan every month, and the economic situation was near to bankruptcy. But Ioannis was sure that the Ottoman money would solve the problem. So he didn't take any measures. News from the Byzantine spies in Venice revealed that Venice could attack Ragusa really soon. Meanwhile, improvements in production technology led Ioannis to set as top priority the investigation and spread of these new methods to the whole Byzantine Empire. This decision had some inflationary results. At the end of May of 1448, it was clear that Gallipoli, as well as Edirne, would fall long before the Ottomans managed to take Pocace. Gallipoli fell at the 12th of July, and the Byzantines ran to reinforce Skanderberg in the siege of Edirne. On the 
26th of August, a Dirne also fell. The victory was total. The plan was implemented by the exquisite Allied generals to the letter. Now it was time for the sweet results and the pisti. The Ottomans were eager to seed all the Byzantine corps in Greece back to Byzantium, but they were not accepting any other concession. The Byzantines needed at least one more province to border Serbia to be able to fabricate a claim there. Serbia would be the next target for the Byzantines. Without the gold mine in Kosovo and the economic means that it would provide the future safety of Byzantium and the ability to maintain a sizable army would be in doubt. And Byzantium also needed money in the peace deal with the Ottomans. A lot of money to be able to repay all the loans that took during the war period. The Romans, after this total victory, would accept nothing less than a total 100% peace deal with the Ottomans. If they managed to do that, they would get 527 ducats in the peace deal as well as Kupi. So the war would continue. Byzantines concentrated their armies in Constantinople and sent a letter to Skanderberg that they were prepared to attack the Ottomans in Kokochev. Instead, Skanderberg invaded Anatolia himself in Karasi. The Byzantines had to follow, in the hope that sometime before Kokochev fell, this odd general would finally make the decision to finish the Ottomans and put an end in this war. The Byzantines, in the 1st of November of 1448, marched against Hudavendika, and this time Skanderberg followed. Although Skanderberg wanted to proceed in the occupation of furthermore provinces in Anatolia, Emperor Ioannis ordered the Byzantine army to engage the Ottomans in Kokoche. For Skanderberg, being so close and not following the Allied army would be treason, and infamy was the only thing that this great general was really afraid of, so he had to commit. In the 29th of November of 1448, the Ottomans officially had no armies to keep fighting. In this monumental battle that remained in history, the fate of Byzantium was sealed. The Romans would live and they would prosper. The Ottomans would eventually fall. In the peace deal that followed, the Ottomans ceded all of Greece to Byzantium as well as Skopje. They also paid 693 ducats in war reparations. Byzantium got 506 of them. Albania and the Knights did not get any land as they were promised. Once again, the Byzantines, having a diplomatic experience of more than 1000 years, took exactly what they wanted with the help of others without giving back anything in return. This is the way that the empires treat small nations like Albania and the Knights. General Skanderberg was outraged. He would attack Byzantium if he could, but he couldn't. The Albanian people were so exhausted by the war that they would rebel. It was an unprecedented triumph. It was the first time in history that the Ottomans not only did they lose a battle or even a war, but would have to reverse their expansion so significantly. The Ottomans went back almost 100 years in time after this war, because Byzantium, as the resurrected Roman Empire, also legitimately gained claims in the Albanian and Bulgarian regions, as well as in the minor Asian coast, claims that were long forgotten by the people of those regions. The economic cost of this war was devastating for the Byzantines, 
Byzantium could not secure any other loan before repaying the existing one. But thankfully, Ioannis had the money from the Pisti. It was the first of many triumphs for the Romans in the years to come. But more about that in the next episode.